Hello, Baron. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we'll have we'll be discussing kind of two things. Uh, first, we'd like to discuss the uh, STS Across Borders initiative for this year's uh, 4S conference in Sydney, and then I would like to talk to you a little more in depth about uh, STS in Australia and, and your particular affiliation with STS at Deakin and your kind of history um, throughout. Great. Can you? Um, Tell me a little bit about the beginning of your career. How did it all begin for you? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Nick. Uh, I, I think uh, probably the beginning uh, is in uh, mucking around in a Sydney landscape, uh, playing in creeks, and uh, um, you know, this is post-war Sydney. Um, we're living in our grandma's house because there's uh, we're war, war orphans and uh, we're uh, you know we're we're pretty free actually uh, and uh, so this the the freedom in this landscape that was uh, full of Sydney bush I, I think it begins there but. Um, uh, and this uh, became in school a sort of a, a love of science and uh, just uh, science. What I found in science lessons was so different to what I found at home and elsewhere that uh, it, it sort of fitted with this freedom that I felt playing in the creek somehow. Uh, so uh, I. But, you know, we were a pretty sort of lower class family and so Sydney University, because uh, I grew up in Sydney, Sydney University rather scared me to be quite honest, so I went to a country university that I thought would be smaller and less challenging, uh, and indeed it was. Um, and I, so I went away to study science. Uh, and. Uh, First of all, you know, natural science, which is where you started in, if you were doing biological sciences, and then uh, chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, and uh, so I thought that I was, I, I was pretty ambitious, I suppose, um, and I thought that I was going to have a career as a metabolic biochemist. And I did for a little while uh, and got a job teaching metabolic biochemistry in England. And I, I studied the Krebs cycle and I had a particular um, enzyme um, that, that I studied to do with ketone metabolism and so on. So it was a fairly obscure part of the Krebs cycle, but um, you know, one in which you could make a uh, you could feel like you were at the cutting edge and so on. Um, coming back to Australia, the, uh, I had two babies by that point and uh, raising two babies and being uh, in a lab just was not on uh, in the 1970s. So uh, I studied to be a um, primary school teacher and so I was probably the only um, metabolic biochemistry biochemist uh, in Australia teaching kindergarten children to read, um, and I think I learned just as much teaching kindergarten children to read uh, as I had in the pre as, as a as a uh, laboratory scientist. Uh, from there, I shifted to teacher education because this was a time in. I was in Victoria by this time. This was a time uh, where Victoria's teachers were being all upgraded from two-year training to three-year training. So there was there were these uh, opportunities to sort of get into teacher education, even though you know I had no background really in education. Uh, and then the chance of a job in Nigeria came up. So I. I I was in Nigeria uh, as a 
um, teacher educator in science and um, pretty and having a great time really yes. um, and um, and fell over numbers as I explain in some detail in uh, science and African logic uh, and it was that falling over numbers that uh, and the way in which they were done differently in Nigerian classrooms that really started me in in science studies uh, and amazingly the um, university book bookshop in uh, Ile Ife in Nigeria uh, I could find Kuhn and I could find all, all the the you know the the cutting edge books on science studies uh, in the 1970s so uh, you know my uh, I, the swerve uh, was actually uh, was partly the bookshop and the books I found there um, uh, partly the the teachers uh, who were sort of doing a push pull thing um, but the philosophy department at the university um, was very strong on the foundations of Yoruba thought and one of the major groups they had was reading Quine's uh, indeterminacy thesis. Mm -hmm. So actually the first philosopher I re ever read, apart from um, uh, sitting in a, a few lectures and reading Popper or, or popular versions of Popper, was Quine and um, it, w it was not easy going but I got hooked really. Yes. Um. So you were following the development of a whole field of STS from quite a distance then? Yes, yes. And, and I think um, it was only later that I realised that it was rather surprising to find all these books. Uh, and I've still got them in my library and they've all got, the, the prices are all written in Naira. So, I, you know, I could, I could identify all the books I bought in Nigeria and there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. it's, um, what was it like to come back from Nigeria to... Uh, to back to Australia? It was, um, it was very peculiar. You know, I had come on holidays, but Australia changed a lot in the 80s. And coming back at the end of the 80s, uh, I was, well, I, and of course I had changed a lot. So it really was uh, a sort of radical, new beginning I, I found that I what I could offer was valued for the first time uh, and, and you know women in academia were being accepted uh, and uh, the, the demeanor I suppose that I'd learned from Nigerian or particularly Yoruba women uh, served me really well uh, in, in this new Australia that I found myself in. And I, it was 1988 and, and so this was the bicentenary and a, of the British invasion. And there was a lot of change in Australia about around that uh, year. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I... Whereas before I'd always come back to Australia or the several times that I'd come back with quite a heavy heart and I had from Nigeria uh, dreading what I'd find I, I was actually you know I found myself very much at home uh, much to my delight mm -hmm. yeah, so. and back in Australia is this when you joined Deakin University yes amazingly um, Max Charlesworth uh, had recruited me as a post, uh, as a uh, visiting research fellow, um, and it, it is um, <laughs> it's a most unlikely transition. Uh, I, you know, Charlesworth was involved in uh, structuralist studies of religion. 
he may well have come across the philosophy department at Obafemi Awolowo University at some international meeting. He never explained to me why uh, my, um, my letter of inquiry, in which I sort of laid out what I could offer, uh, actually interested him. Um, but um, yeah, so I came back to Deakin uh, as a <coughs> visiting research fellow in the uh, science studies unit in the School of Humanities. And so uh, this was the third faculty that I'd been in. I'd started in science faculties, shifted to education faculties, and now I was in a humanities faculty, um, which I didn't think much of at the time, but I think it would be rather hard to pull off these days. Mm -hmm. yes, um, is this the time when you got engaged with a, a program uh, in indigenous knowledge? Yes. Uh, at um, Deakin University School of Education, uh, which I sort of contacted with, uh, of course, you know, this is uh, a background. Uh, they were just getting involved with teaching a group of uh, indigenous uh, teacher assistants. Now, I, I'd been training uh, teach Victorian classroom teachers with two-year training. Um, the um, teaching assistants uh, in the Northern Territory had probably, you know, less than that. But, but uh, there was an urgent need to uh, ensure that there was a cohort of traditional uh, or Aboriginal leaders who lived in remote communities who had a, a three-year training in uh, education to run the schools that was were currently being devolved to local councils. Uh, and so Deakin um, contracted with the Northern Territory department, because this was still the administration, um, uh, to offer this third year. And basically, I was the only body, only body on the staff who had uh, significant cross-cultural experience. So uh, even though it wasn't part of my um, uh, remit, if you like, as, as a visiting research scholar, I, I actually took up, uh, I took, undertook to teach the uh, maths education, maths and science education uh, element uh, of, of that program. So, and it involved Deacon staff going up to the Northern Territory uh, for weeks at a time. Uh, both to Bachelor, where it was based, and to the communities where these students came from. Mm -hmm. You say that you were one of the only ones that had a, a cross-cultural kind of background and this helped you um, with this program, but how, how do you position yourself as a non-Indigenous scholar engaged in these knowledge traditions? Yes, I've always been very explicit that uh, what I offer is a translation uh, that um, it's, uh, I'm uh, learning, I learned an enormous amount about uh, Indigenous knowledge, partly because the elders in these communities took this program very seriously and realised that if the uh, students who were going to lead the schools were going to get a decent education, they had to do something about um, training, in other words, the elders training the teachers. So I had um, both a man and a woman appointed as my teachers in the community, uh, and they took that very seriously. So I, I feel as if I was the recipient of a tremendous gift uh, in that. But um, they were very explicit that my role was to work out how to uh, translate this, that they were not teaching me to, um, you know, be uh, a knower in an, an indigenous uh, knowledge tradition. Um, 
but I was to be a translator. No, and not a, a language translator. There were plenty of those, and I wasn't very good at that anyway. Um, one of the things that um, people often said to me in the in the uh, North East Arnhem community, which is where I spent most of the time, is, oh, those Yoruba teachers, they did a good job of softening you up. Um, in other words, you know, I, I, they found me easier to teach because indeed I'd been thrown about by eight years in Nigerian classrooms uh, and knew how much work was actually involved in uh, working out what, how to translate and what to translate and where to translate and, and how to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. While you were doing your work in Arnhemland, how was the Deakin SDS community developing? This was quite a, a young community at the time. Yes, uh, it, it, didn't, it was extremely supportive of my uh, sort of branching out in, into Arnhem Land, um, partly because it had, um, since its beginnings, uh, when uh, David Wayne, Wade Chambers was recruited from Harvard, uh, it, it, it had taken indigenous knowledge very seriously. And indeed, in the Deacon remit, there was a clause which said it must that the new, this new university uh, established in the 19, early 1970s must uh, take seriously uh, indigenous knowledge. So this was sort of mandated. Uh, and um, David Wayne Chambers comes from Oklahoma. And like many Oklahomans, Homans, Homians, I don't know how to say it, um, has significant Cherokee uh, family roots uh, still um, so uh, and uh, and a PhD from Harvard in the history of science so he's he's a unique um, uniquely placed in a way uh, and um, so already uh, Wade and David Turnbull who was then the tutor uh, were significantly looking or looking at other indigenous traditions and David through uh, looking at maps uh, and studying maps and as this artifact that sort of goes through um, um, many knowledge traditions uh, and uh, weighed very often through visual representations. So Deakin was, Deakin Science Studies Unit, uh, the curriculum that was developing was uh, very serious about Indigenous knowledge uh, and indeed Max Charlesworth had just uh, edited a volume on uh, religious thought in Aboriginal Australia. Uh, so, and that was a scholarly publication. Uh, Max um, was the only philosopher amongst the whole lot of ethnographers and anthropologists, and he he would have wished for more philosophers um, to be interested. So it was very serious, and it wasn't anthropology, and that was a really significant difference. Uh, the anthropologists as a discipline were actually very suspicious of this um, upstart, um, you know, specifically translational approach to indigenous knowledge and thought. Yes. Why were they suspicious? Well, <coughs> partly they thought it was their turf. Um, but uh, also they, um, well, anthropology itself was going through a lot of uh, anti-colonial or post-colonial um, worry about its, uh, on finding itself as, you know, the major intellectual tradition underlying colonialism. Uh, uh, so it, it was going through quite a lot of angst, 
but it it um, it was suspicious too of the specifically of the explicitly um, philosophical element uh, in, in this translational approach that we were um, developing. Yeah, so. And from Deakin, you went to uh, HPS at the University of Melbourne, which is uh, the Department of Historical and Philosophical Studies. Is that correct? Th that's right. Uh, I, I first of all, uh, Melbourne University offered me a uh, what was called a women's re-entry post um, research fellowship. Um, for women who had, uh, you know, had their careers upset, uh, turned upside down, inside out, by child rearing. So it, it was, you know, an affirmative action movement uh, or an expression of that movement. Uh, and first of all, I joined the anthropology department at University of Melbourne. And I found this most uncongenial, <laughs> to be quite honest. Uh, and um, then uh, requested a shift to history and philosophy of science. So I actually entered uh, history and philosophy of science as from the anthropology department uh, to some suspicion, but you know nobody took it very seriously. Uh, this was just another of these people who would inhabit a few offices and. Uh, then disappear, uh, but they were welcoming and so on. And, and I happened to arrive the same week that Bruno arrived, also as a visiting fellow, rather. Uh, Bruno Latour. Yes, yes. So we were put in an office, an office more or less under the stairs uh, in old arts. Um, and we, we both loved the Beau Repair Swimming Centre. So he would hang his swimmers on one end to dry and I would hang mine on the other, sort of <laughs> a form of intimacy that we've laughed about ever since, really. Mm -hmm. it's, um, does, is there a difference between HPS and, and STS and, and does this difference matter? In, at least in the there, there is a difference and I think it does matter uh, and I'm all for um, keeping separations as much as making connections and I think uh, that um, learning how to do this well and learning how to do, if you like, a, a, a political epistemics of dissent well is something that we're not very good at uh, in um, the Anglophone uh, tradition. Uh, so I, I want to acknowledge the connection, but also emphasize the separation. Um, philosophy and history are very different to uh, what I was being inducted into uh, as re really was sociology of science uh, at Deakin. And, and it was a concern to explain difference rather than um, explain difference away. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and this certainly began a, as a social, um, as, a so, as a social enterprise. And I think it's got its roots back in ethno-methodology. Um, not that I knew that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Do you think that there's something um, identifiable as Australian STS and, and something that makes it unique? I, I think there is. And I think uh, it partly goes back to uh, this concern with indigeneity. No, not that all STS uh, has that concern in Australia, or, or that it should. Uh, but I think this concern with difference uh, that does, that is rooted in that respect for the difference of indigenous thought uh, does actually come through uh, and it inflects the STS 
uh, in Australia that that is coming from I think the British um, constructivist school, the relativists, um, and also the um, pragmatists, the uh, grounded theory, uh, symbolic interactionists in America. So I think both those um, influences are there in Australian STS. And the, if you like, the, the, the gravity, the centre of gravity uh, or the gravitational pull of in needing to engage seriously with Indigenous thought uh, does uh, make STS in Australia somewhat different to both Europe uh, and America. Uh, and I think it's this, I think it is a concern with difference and, and how to do difference well. It's, um, mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier this uh, metaphor of working under the stairs with Bruno Latour and you also have some experience working in, in Nigeria. What is it like to work from the periphery to perhaps even occupy a marginalized voice in global STS? Yes, well, um, when, of course, Bruno doesn't, um, <laughs> but when he was in Australia, the, the uh, I think it was he who said this first, he said, well, in history and philosophy of science, I think you're the only person who can hear what I'm saying, and I think I'm the only person who can hear what you're saying. And I think that was correct. And Bruno did experience himself as highly marginal in Australia. Uh, and, and the department that he was visiting uh, had recently uh, absorbed social theory, which was Frankfurt School Habermas all the way. Uh, and um, so, uh, but of course, you know, that, that's another story. But working from the periphery, I've, uh, w which I do both in, uh, on STS, I do both in America, but much more so in Europe, um, and uh, not so much in Britain, uh, but, uh, but in uh, the Scandinavian uh, STS uh, community and increasingly in Germany. Uh, so, uh, working from the periphery there, uh, on the one hand in Scandinavian STS, they're really just beginning to attend to the indigenous th uh, traditions of Sami. So, so that's clearly a connection there. Uh, but uh, I, I find that uh, what being on the periphery and being uh, uh, having this concern with uh, how to do dissent well, uh, connecting and separating, uh, is really quite. Um, it 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 goes well in Germany. Uh, it can be heard in Germany. Can actually be heard better in Germany than in Australia, really. It's, um, so, uh, you know, there are uh, always benefits uh, to working on the periphery, but there are also enormous costs. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, sure. The fact that Australia is so, um, so far away from kind of big STS hubs in Europe or the United States, what kind of um, contributions uh, can Australian STS scholars make and what kind of shape can these contributions take? Yes, uh, in, in part to answer that uh, Australian STS needs to, uh, in, in a way, understand itself uh, more explicitly as peripheral uh, and see where its influences are coming from and how they're being inflected through being taken up here where 
I mean, it's not only SDS that's peripheral, science is peripheral here too. And um, so what working uh, as a peripheral uh, discipline um, I, uh, to um, look, to consider science uh, in a, in a place where science is peripheral um, and uh, not well funded and uh, not well respected, really. Um, I mean, everybody would rather be sailing or playing football or uh, you know, being being a nerd in Australia is not that easy. Yes, um, for, and this is so for scientists as well as uh, those who critique science. Mm -hmm. it's, um, so, I mean, part of answering what can SDS offer, what can Australian SDS offer, uh, is uh, considering, well, what can Australian science offer? Uh, and um, that that's... Um, the idea that a science can be place specific and should be place specific is not an easy sell in science really it's, um, so um, <clears throat> I, I think one of the things that STS uh, needs to do in Australia is be much more assertive when it comes to engaging with scientists uh, and much more have much greater expectations of scientists uh, that they understand their own epistemic practices, that they understand that they have epistemic practices would be a good start. Um, so, uh, the, and this uh, th this requires confidence, uh, and it requires STS in Australia to be aware of its, its own epistemic practices, which uh, is not always the case, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, some scholars in the Northern Hemisphere would say that there's not much SDS going on in Australia because most Australian universities don't have an explicit STS department. Um, coming back to Deakin University, can you tell us a little bit more about the promise that Deakin SDS is, is, um, has going for it? Yes, Deakin, uh, when it was established, was established as a regional uh, and explicitly uh, external provider of, of university education. Uh, and, um, you know, science has always been extremely influential in the in the regions in Australia. I mean, I know this seems odd, but, you know, Australia was a development state for a, a long time, uh, and science is crucial. So, um, science and uh, the Australian regions are quite uh, well known, although we tend to think of science as a metropolitan activity. Um, so uh, this was one of the thinking, well, this is part of the thinking, I think, behind a Deakin uh, Science Studies unit. Uh, it, it was recognising the role that science played, had played in uh, Australian development, or development of, as, as a, an advanced economy. Um, and um, I, I think, uh, so there was an explicitness about uh, Deakin science studies that, that is unusual and uh, it disappeared in the 1990s as neoliberalism took out a, a lot of uh, disciplines in uh, Australian universities. Um, but I, I think it's still there uh, that um, focus on uh, regionality, that focus on external forms of uh, education. Uh, so so that, that the original impetus that had a science studies unit established at Deakin is it, still there, really. 
Um, but of course now uh, it's really, really difficult to have any disciplinary base uh, in an Australian university. Um, and um, here, in, in a way, science studies is better placed than a lot of other um, disciplines uh, like philosophy. Um, STS has been used to uh, getting out there and getting dirty uh, as a sort of non-discipline, interdiscipline, transdiscipline, whatever, for a very long time. So uh, STS practitioners are used to working in multidisciplinary teams and this is where and how STS happens in Australia more or less everywhere. It's, uh, you, you get it uh, in you, you get isolated individuals or small groups flourishing as small groups within uh, research programs, um, more or less uh, helping anthropologists very often to do interdisciplinary research. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've talked a little bit now about uh, making connections, but holding separations. Uh, I would like to talk a bit more about exactly the the tensions between philosophy, your one of your main interests, and anthropology. It's a tension that plays out in your career, but it also is a tension that's playing out in STS today, with uh, specifically, let's say, the ontological term. Uh, you've mentioned uh, as well a, a couple of uh, kind of concepts. Uh, you had an experience of falling over numbers, uh, of discussing how to become a, a knower or a translator, um, how to explain difference and not explain it away. Um, you've developed a particular or even peculiar vernacular that is trying to work the tension between these two disciplines. So let me start with one of uh, your uh, signal terms, the disconcertment. Please tell me more about the disconcertment. Yes, <coughs> I, disconcertment uh, is, is, I find, a very useful concept. I, I use it as an analytic concept, but of course it's just an ordinary word uh, and uh, it's a fairly unusual word. Most people don't come home and say, oh, I was very disconcerted. To, uh, so um, it, it's useful in that sense, in that, uh, and I also like the, the dis and the concert uh, and the, uh, the way they go together. And that, um, um, the, so I quite like the idea of being concerted as much as I like the idea of disconcertment. And it's much harder to uh, realise, oh, I'm very concerted. Uh, in other words, you know, I'm very at ease or I'm very at home in this concept than, I, than disconcertment. But anyway, so disconcertment is a very good pedagogical tool. Uh, students get it. Uh, and you only need to, any um, any gathering of ethnographers, and they know instantly what you're talking about. They know it in their bodies, so uh, it, it's it does all this work for me. Um, but <coughs> I actually, uh, for me, uh, although it does this this ordinary everyday linguistic work and pedagogical work, uh, it's really epistemic disconcertment uh, that is at the core of my concern. And that's actually quite harder to get. Very often <coughs> you'll find that there's an, epi an epistemic disconcertment at the core of a disconcertment you've, suffer you've experienced. But it takes a lot of work to uh, a, work out the epistemic practices uh, and what they were, which particular 
uh, and precise epistemic practices were somehow outraged, were somehow flagrantly ignored or transgressed in any particular uh, episode of disconcertment. So it's, uh, it allows you to do a lot of um, thought work. Uh, and doing thought work with words. So what you're doing there is um, in a way using, using words very carefully and I, I think that's um, you know, respect for words and love of words uh, is I think core also in disconcertment. It's, um, so one has the disconcertment in trying to become a knowing self. What do you mean with becoming a knowing self, the term that you've used a couple of times already? Yes, I used it first in Germany uh, when I was asked to give a lecture in what they called uh, humanistic uh, transcultural psychology. Uh, and um, it was in a way trying to make sense of what that could be uh, because this is all in German and I don't read German very well uh, that I came up with this translating idea of a knowing self uh, and I started with the baby uh, and of course you know this is unusual uh, in um, humanistic thought to to talk about the knowing self by talking about the baby. It's usually the uh, <clears throat> the angst-filled man uh, who who's the figure here. So, so this uh, and I, I had a photograph of a baby who's a friend of mine um, who was a little a uh, brown-skinned girl and so to have this as the figure of the knowing self was actually very helpful <clears throat> and t talking about the way in which that knowing self becomes a knowing body uh, and eventually a word using knowing body uh, is really the figure of this knowing self that I want to cultivate. Um, and so it goes along with this respect for words and the idea that words and predication, and this outrages linguists, predication as a bodily matter, uh, not a matter of the mind. Um, and, and so this you know, it, it's quite um, quite an important figure in me beginning to get across uh, this different conception of what it is to be a translator who connects and separates explicitly. So. Is this um, interest in embodiment and in language uh, something that has is? more known as material semiotics perhaps in the, in the greater SDS discipline? It is, but um, I, I don't use that term very often because um, material semiotics in a way it has this vision of language as language injected into everything Whereas for me, uh, <laughs> it uh, goes the other way, uh, that language is not coming down from the head and being injected uh, into experience. Uh, rather, uh, words emerge from bodies and generate experiences. In your work, you speak a lot about uh, making explicit metaphysical commitments. This is a very strange thing to do, or even strange thing to say. W what do you mean by this? It, it goes with uh, being aware of our epistemic practices 
And of course, uh, this goes right back to uh, my being uh, re-softened, if you like, by the Aboriginal elders who took me uh, in their, um, uh, took me under their epistemic care, if you like. Um, and they kept um, shaking their heads in despair that unless we white people learn, you know, what we're really committed to in the world and unless we can say it, we'll never get anywhere in understanding what they're committed to and recognising it as different. So it, uh, this challenge to, uh, that comes with being this translating knowing self, uh, to be uh, aware in an embodied sense of your um, commitments. Okay, and they are metaphysical commitments. We, metaphysics is a funny word uh, anyway, um, but people do get it. Um, that it's something strange and beyond what we normally think about. Uh, so it's, uh, it's about knowing what your epistemic practices are and, and what you absolutely, you know, just take for granted and being explicit about that. Um, and, and, you know, one of the <clears throat> examples that I often give of this is learning to be explicit about this modern figure of matter set in space-time. I mean, that, that's actually not a very uh, profound um, metaphysical commitment, but it is, it's a metaphysical commitment of science uh, and of mm, much popular modern thought that, that um, you know, that, that we think of the world as stuff sitting in, you know, empty space and time. That, that's how we foreground it. Yeah, so. And then we read that into our Indo-European languages and it gets embedded and uh, it's explicit in science and uh, then it's very hard to... Um, to see that it's really just a translating figure. It's just a, it's just doing work there, and you can go on without it. Mm -hmm. it's, um, Another funny word that you tend to use, uh, maybe one that has been misunderstood, um, specific to your connection to to philosophy, uh, and in a way the connection to the ontological turn in, in anthropology. Much has talked and much has said about the word ontology, but you have a preference for the word ontics. Now, what what exactly is ontics, and what is its relationship to ontology? Yes, uh, ontics is different to ontology, um, but uh, as soon as you start talking about ontics, you're doing ontology. Um, so uh, it's extremely difficult to point to ontics, but it is uh, what this um, knowing, emerging baby has as she becomes a, a knowing, embodied self. She knows uh, how to stand up by hanging on to things and using tables as participants in, in her being in the world. Uh, and so the, the baby has an ontic understanding of a, a, a low solid table that she can hang on to, to haul herself to her feet. Um, and when she, then later on, uh, she will, if she's learning to speak English, uh, she w she might name uh, the table as table, and, and that's just sort of heralding the table, just uh, pointing uh, and then categorising. That's a table, that's a chair. Um, but then later on, she will predicate, uh, and then she's doing ontology. 
So you might say uh, something is on the table, uh, being a bit surprised if the cat hops up on the table. She, she might say cat on table and, and then she's making a predicating sentence uh, and she's doing ontology. Uh, so ontology uh, involves words and as soon as you start talking about ontics you're doing ontology. Sure. One of the uh, misunderstandings and and this is going to lead me to a couple of questions on ethics and politics in, in STS or in specific in your work. One of the uh, uh, confusions perhaps with the use of the words ontology is that uh, ontology tends to be a particular uh, vernacular philosophy and the fact that philosophy has a drive towards making foundational claims Let's take the example of Descartes' cogito in this in this instance, and that um, ontology is not actually being, but the discourse that treats being qua being, and that this discourse is in, is in a sense uh, political. But because this is uh, in STS quite uh, controversial, is the fact that STS brings with it. Uh, a certain anthropological sense, uh, an, an anti-colonial, uh, anti-ethnocentric uh, sense, in which there is a, in a sense, a profound respect for the other. So, on the one hand, you have philosophy that is interested in making a foundational claim, and on the other, you have anthropology that is uh, trying to have a push an absolute respect for the other. Um, how do these marry together? It, it's, it's difficult. Um, one, of the, one of my tricks, if you like, for starting to um, tease out these difficulties uh, is to insist that ontology, is to insist on the ology in, in the ontology, th that it is a, a study uh, of the ontic. Um, now, of course, I disagree profoundly with the philosophers who understand the ontic as given, stable, found. Uh, and for me, the ontic is uh, emergent and ontology is really just an extension of uh, ontics. Uh, and, um, but in, uh, in anthropology, uh, this profound respect for what, what's often called the ontologies uh, that the other uses, uh, and um, you find this in um, uh, a lot of the South American uh, work uh, uh, that um, trying to the anthropology wants to um, recognize the what I would call the metaphysical commitments of the other in its own terms um, but of course then you have to worry about your translation um, and so the latest shift or the latest move uh, in the anthropological uh, ontological turn is to suggest that the translation the the figure of the translation the metaphysics metaphysical commitments of the translation uh, is uh, as much an outcome uh, for the anthropologist to discern uh, as the ontology of the other. So you, you get this um, recursive uh, going back into the um, you know, distance of ontologies within ontologies within ontologies within ontologies. Um, and so it actually uh, becomes very difficult to say anything. Uh, so. 
Um, I, I'm not sure that that latest move is going to be generative. Um, and so this is why I think, okay, you have to stand somewhere. These are my metaphysical commitments. Uh, and um, th this means that whatever I offer is partial, both limited and interested. Um, but the best I can do is um, tell you the analytic framing that it's generated in and then, sorry everybody, but you have to do the rest. Yes. If mutual respect were the primary way of getting on in the here and now, we would have to affirm certain divergent uh, possible worlds, kind of Leibnizian universe. Uh, you could insist that there are other ways in which being can be enacted or performed. You wouldn't be the only one saying this. Perhaps a number of scholars in STS would, would make this claim. So there would be a, a certain multiplicity of being. However, if the insistence on multiple possibles uh, renders possibility itself as ontologically unitary, so while being may be multiple, ontology uh, tends to move to the unitary or towards uh, unicity in some sense. How do you work through this kind of aporia in, a, in good faith? Yeah, I mean, I think um, this comes back to the here and now. Uh, yes, multiple possibles, multiple possible worlds, uh, and they're always there, but um, when uh, you want to reach an agreement, when, when it's important that uh, an agreement will hold, uh, then you have to, it's radically situationist. It's here, it's now, it's these people, it's these words. Uh, so it's, I, th I think uh, it might be useful to think of this as a situated truth form. And this is a sort of Nietzschean uh, move to say there are multiple truth forms and that multiple truth forms are always in play uh, in the multiple worlds, of course, because worlds bring their, their own multiple truth forms. But uh, to um, agree enough on a sort of radically situated um, uh, truth form here and now uh, with these people at this time, talking about this thing. And um, I think I first had a vision of this before I thought about it very deeply. And it's a vision that comes from participating in a yawn or ceremony when um, uh, there's an agreement, and, and a ceremony is an active political, ethical negotiation over something very often a murder uh, or multiple murders or, you know, grievous, egregious uh, harms. Uh, and there's, if there's an agreement uh, and everybody agrees there's an agreement, uh, a spear is thrown into the ground. Uh, and this is called a galta, and it is possibly the most sacred uh, place. Uh, and there are galtas, there are many galtas, and, and some are more sacred than others. Um, so this, in a way, the spear, like, uh, the vision is that it penetrates through to s some other um, realm and constitutes a truth form. So I've, I've got a vision of this and I had a vision of it happening uh, and a sense of relief after the spear is thrown into the ground and the galter is established uh, before I got it, if you see what I mean. So I, I think I'm extremely fortunate to have learned <laughs> a lot of uh, a different way of thinking from actually participating in it uh, through, you know, just being really fortunate uh, in my experiences in Aboriginal Australia. 
in your work you also uh, use the word comparison. It's also a, a term that um, you've had discussions with other scholars with. What do you mean with doing comparison and what do you mean with comparison being participant? Yes, a comparison uh, of course is, is another one of these words. It's a bit like disconcertment. It's a very ordinary word. People do it all the time uh, and sometimes you know it's explicit about what's being compared and you, you can't compare apples and oranges except you can sometimes. Um, um, but comparison for me really has to be something really quite profound and it has to, if it's going to be generative, uh, people have to realise in, in a way that a number is already a comparison uh, and that comparison is often effected in iteration. Uh, and comparison disappears in iteration just as people don't usually think of number as a comparison but there, there are actually quite a few uh, as there's a whole series of comparisons embedded in just the, the number two um, as, as in where two people sitting here having a conversation um, so I take comparison very seriously, uh, unlike m many others who, for whom it's really a uh, fairly superficial uh, method. It's, um, mm -hmm. So you've mentioned uh, earlier the um, ethnography as a, as, a, as a method or ethnographers uh, as uh, certain scholars that you've been around. How do you do generative work? What, what, what is ethnography for, uh, ethnography for you? And how does it differ from the kind of ethnography other you know, anthropologists might be used to? Yeah, I, I think um, my ethnography is pretty different. Uh, although I'm, I don't always, I mean, you don't go around saying, oh, I do it differently. Uh, the, the whole point about using the word ethnography is that you do end up with some people to talk to and it's no good if you, if you don't have anybody to talk to. Um, but eth ethnography for me is tied up for, with the difference between doing ontics and doing ontology. Um, and uh, it's tied up with disconcertment uh, and knowing your epistemic practices. Uh, and uh, I, I, when I teach people to do ethnography, I teach them to write stories. In other words, not descriptions. There's, in, there's nothing... Uh, um, I, I don't... It's not an ethnos. So in a way, ethnography is not really what it is because I'm not trying to describe an ethnos. Um, well, I might be. Uh, I'm trying to get this situated, uh, to get at this situated truth form um, that uh, an ethnographic story, and it has to be a story, uh, emerges uh, out of a disconcertment uh, and the disconcertment is being read there as something trying to break through the surface of an everyday ongoing banal existence that takes multiple ontologies for granted. So it's trying to get hold of what it is that's trying to poke its head up from underneath. Uh, that ethnography um, is, is important for me. I think ethography might be a better term because it's about the ethos of the situation, the ethos of the moment, the trajectory. Um, 
but I'm not going to go around saying I do ethography because that's what people who study birds do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, coming back to, uh, thank you for this, coming back to uh, philosophy and perhaps some of the influences you mentioned earlier, Quine, you also mentioned Thomas Kuhn. Um, I have kind of identified three sets of influences in your work. The pragmatists, Dewey and Peirce, that we see uh, in various guises in your work, Michel Serre, and the post-structuralists, if you could call them post-structuralists, Foucault and Deleuze, which uh, take a, a, a shape in your work that isn't always obvious, but looking at your interest in uh, doing difference, um, discussing disconcertment or events, it's clear that, that those figures play a role. So let, let's start with the pragmatists. Yes, um, the pragmatists actually came into my life in the form of Catherine Pine Adelson, uh, a feminist philosopher uh, who worked in uh, Smith College. Uh, and um, she, um, was first and foremost a feminist uh, and um, in a way came always worked from first principles and first principles were her reading of Nietzsche um, and um, but she she went on from that and um, in a way her feminist philosophy uh, she connected with the symbolic interactionist uh, and she did a course with Howard Becker. So she did sociologists and she, she, she wrote this paper why sociologists should always be philosophers and philosophers always sociologists. But, but it's very 1980s work. Um, but it, it was really her work that I first uh, got into, uh, or sort of took seriously pragmatism. I'd studied um, Dewey as a, as a sort of avuncular uh, philosopher of education. Um, and, <laughs> and really a, a very, adopted a very Dewey, the, the work that I did in Nigeria is very inspired by Dewey's Chicago School um, and um, but I hadn't actually read Dewey uh, and I, I think well, I really liked the early papers of Dewey I think 1905 is where I go up to and these are short sharp papers uh, and I use his um, notion of what experience is in, in discussing ethnography, for example, that uh, for him experience is uh, the experience of experience. Um, and he's, he's got a great 1905 paper uh, ranting against uh, immediate empiricism. Um, so uh, Dewey, Peirce, yes. Um, I'm not sure I do Peirce any favours in the way I use him. Um, but also through them uh, back to Whitehead, I think, to, uh, and uh, through Whitehead to Deleuze. Um, and it's, it, I think it is quite a strong sort of river that, that flows uh, through uh, you know, the way I think. Uh, and, and gives me images uh, to work with, that, that, which is really what I take from all those uh, philosophers. Mm -hmm. you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Deleuze. Uh, of course, uh, Deleuze has become the signal popular philosopher of the last uh, couple of years, uh, not only in, in, in uh, continental philosophy, but in anthropology there's a turn to Deleuze, in sociology there's a turn to Deleuze, in STS you see Deleuze everywhere. Um, 
you speak a lot about doing difference differences perhaps the the key concept around which uh, Deleuze works um, but why is Deleuze not explicitly visible in, in your work partly because I find him so hard to read um, but I do like uh, you know repetition and difference uh, so this is the book I read but I read it um, in episodically in, in fits and starts um, not uh, as entire um, arguments um, yeah but also what is philosophy um, probably those two beginning and end uh, are, or not really beginning but um, that, that, there and, and partly <laughs> I don't refer to him because everybody else does. Mm. Um, so this is just a, um, a peculiarity of my um, um, uh, style, I suppose. Mm -hmm. it's, um, pa and partly because everybody else does, you, you're prone to be misunderstood and uh, you know people stop thinking about what you're actually talking about. It, um. Sure. Thank you very much for talking about your, your influences. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the, the interlocutors that you have right now. You, you mentioned your relationship with, with Bruno Latour, but you also have a very strong relationship with um, both John Law and Anna Marie Moll. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how these relationships came about? Yeah, it it, um, it came through invitations to participate in seminars and, and workshops and so on. John Law was uh, and is very um, inclusive. Um, and when you live in Australia, people have to raise a lot of money if they're going to get you and uh, you know John was fairly good at raising money um, uh, so um, and uh, I, I think uh, when I first ra raised this idea of ontics Anne-Marie Moll was in the hall uh, in, in the workshop uh, and uh, she bridled at that and still does um, and, and won't go there uh, and so they're, they've, they've certainly uh, been useful uh, in interlocutors um, but the, uh, there are significant differences uh, as, as well um, which we acknowledge and, uh, and are generative. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and the same with Bruno. Um, I will never. I disagreed with his pre-moderns, uh, 1988, and I still do. Yes. You're not the only one. Yeah. Mm. Um, I guess the last interlocutor that I um, would like to talk about is one that also is uh, working the tension between anthropology and, and philosophy. Is Marilyn Strathern? How's uh, her work influenced you? Yes, I, I think uh, she's been someone I've written against uh, very often and I think you can see this if you look at her little pamphlet called The Relation, uh, which was her um, um, professorial lecture at Cambridge. Uh, and she, her, her account of The Relation uh, is uh, a modern uh, abstractionist uh, relation uh, and that is exactly what my the relation that I work with is not uh, but um, I find I often use the word decomposition uh, when I'm talking about ethnography uh, and um, I think her, her account of decomposition, um, which uh, I, I think uh, all her work is um, really, well I think ethnography is always a double movement, 
Uh, and I think most ethnography is a double movement, bef uh, and, and it's always a decomposing and a recomposing. Most ethnography uses, first of all, an abductive generalisation. In, in other words, uh, going from the general to the uh, particular, uh, and then uh, an inductive going from the specific to the general. Um, and I think there are two sorts of inductive recompositions. And I think what I'm, what I'm thinking about at the moment is uh, this radically situated truth form, I think is a double abductive generalization. Um, so that's where I'm currently trying to uh, head off to. Well, thank you very much. We've, uh, we've had time to discuss uh, your background, your thoughts on SDS in Australia and SDS globally. Uh, we talked a little a bit about uh, your work and, and the, some of the concepts that you've introduced to, to the field. We've talked about your influences and, and some of your interlocutors. Uh, before we finish up, I'd like to ask you, how your students and, and intellectual friends and acquaintances relate to your work and how we can connect to it and take it further? I, I think uh, picking up on difference uh, and how uh, to do difference in a situated way in the here and now uh, and really respecting what words can do. Uh, I, I think uh, they're all, when I look at people who, are, who I'm working with, uh, young, younger people and uh, other people, they're, they're the things that are being uh, picked up. Uh, and so this, um, this, how we do difference, how we respect difference here and now, and the different sorts of difference that we have to work out how to uh, do, um, I, I think that's uh, where, where it will go. Uh, and the, there's one group that called this cosmopolitics, pick, uh, you know, really picking up a quite different notion of cosmopolitics from Stengers and uh, Latour, although with connections. Um, then there are others who see this as situated ethnography. Um, and uh, others who uh, really uh, pick it up uh, in imagining what governance should be. So, that, I mean, this is a highly applied area uh, and, and um, I seem to offer something that's uh, fairly arcane um, but it's really gratifying to see that it actually can make a difference uh, and I think um, that working out how to do good governance here and now and working out how we know what good governance is um, that in a way rolls into um, some of what I hope my thinking will lead, you know, offer a few clues mm -hmm. to in the future. One of the um, fields, uh, unusual fields that have uh, been interested in your work, has taken your work up, is the field of management or organization studies. A couple of colleagues that are uh, reading your work, taking their time, thinking it's very hard and confusing, but are, are realizing that there's uh, some value in this. Um, you have actually started, you've worked with a number of organizations in your life, but you're also now working in uh, Arnhem Land on uh, certain organizations that are, as you say, connecting up with the services economy, this kind of uh, fear that we might have feel across the academy, the kind of commercialization of, of organizations. How does, how is this uh, work coming along and what, what are you doing in this case? 
What, what I'm uh, doing there is, uh, yeah, it, it is in organization studies. Um, and, uh, you know, service delivery, uh, human services delivery in the Northern Territory has gone very far down this road of marketization and um, all the human services delivery in Aboriginal Australia, in remote Aboriginal Australia, is uh, on the basis of contracts. Uh, and so the, the notion of human services delivery products uh, is, you know, it, it's a weird uh, entity uh, and peculiarly th that embeds a whole lot of uh, what I've been thinking about for many, many years. I mean, it actually, you have to think really, really carefully. Uh, and this brings in evaluation. Uh, and so working out how we're going to uh, be able to critique this new um, world where epistemics is really bought and sold. You know, epistemics is a product, and it's a product that's in these uh, human services delivery products. Uh, and um, that, how we think about that is not at all obvious. It's, um, so this is why I think governance uh, in this world of uh, services delivery products um, is uh, a really crucial place for us to get our thinking together pretty quickly too. It's, uh... Helen, thank you very much for your time. We've covered a, a range of subjects and I wish you all the best with your uh, research going forward. Thank you, Nick. You've been a wonderful uh, um, person to have a conversation with. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.